Welcome. My name is uh, Catherine Cornille, and in name of the Department of Theology here at Boston College, I want to welcome you all to this, our fifth and final BC Symposium on Interreligious Dialogue. We are delighted to see so many people here. I think there's a little more room in the side uh, room for people, and f please feel free to just sit on the floor where you find some space. Uh, we're very happy to see so many people interested in uh, these colloquia. For the past five years, Boston College has invited prominent scholars from different religious traditions and different parts of the world to come together and to reflect on certain fundamental topics in interreligious dialogue. The purpose of these conferences is really to focus sharply on certain problematic issues or challenging issues in the dialogue and thereby move the dialogue forward. Uh, the first year, the topic of the conference was criteria of discernment in interreligious dialogue. So we focused on what the uh, criteria and norms are by which p religions judge each other. When we engage in dialogue with one another, there are always implicit uh, norms and, and criteria that are operative, and during that conference, we focused on what those were. The second year, uh, the topic was interreligious hermeneutics, and that focused on ways of understanding other religious traditions, what are the uh, challenges and possibilities of understanding across religious uh, traditions. Uh, also, what are the ways in which religions borrow from one another and integrate elements from other religions within their own self-understanding. The third year, uh, we focused on interreligious dialogue and economic development. Uh, and here we looked at what religions can learn from one another in uh, dealing with the problems of equality and economic justice. Um, and then last year, we focused on uh, interreligious dialogue and cultural change. There we looked at uh, how religions who are coming to the United States are invited or forced to enter into dialogue with other religions that are already part of the American landscape and how that uh, prompts or promotes uh, dialogue. So this year, the focus of our uh, symposium is the role of women in interreligious dialogue. Unfortunately, in the last uh, symposia, we haven't had too many women uh, as part of the uh, colloquium, and therefore we thought it would be important to think about why it is that women are often not part of our uh, uh, interreligious dialogues, and how we can uh, think about what has happened in the past and what we can do to change things towards the future. So the papers of this colloquium are both looking to the past. Uh, how has interreligious dialogue helped in shaping the self-understanding of women in different religions? And what are the challenges that women have encountered in the past? And we're also uh, looking at the future, at what the distinct contribution of women might be to interreligious dialogue, whether there is a distinct contribution of women to interreligious dialogue and what that might be. So again, we have uh, gathered uh, a good number of prominent scholars, this time all women, uh, from different religions and from different generations to uh, reflect on uh, this particular topic. Um, so um, if you aren't able to be part of the uh, discussions in Dover, the papers will be published about this time next year, and I hope at least you will have an idea of what has been uh, transpiring. Uh, um, in those discussions. But tonight we're all here uh, to listen to one of the great uh, pioneers of feminism, of Catholic feminism, Rosemary Ruther. Uh, before I introduce her though, I want to give the floor to two women who have played uh, a vital uh, role in the organizing of these conferences, not only this year, but all of the years leading up to this conference. Um, First, I want to introduce to you Mary Lou DeLong, who is uh, Vice President of Boston College and University Secretary. Mary Lou DeLong has played an indispensable role, um, not only in securing the funding for these conferences, but also in helping organize all of the logistics uh, surrounding these conferences. Since she's very well connected at the university, she's made my job 
immeasurably easier by gathering people uh, together. And so I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank her for all of her help in organizing these and give her the floor. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I want to add my words of welcome to all of you uh, for this symposia on women in interreligious dialogue. I first want to thank someone who is not here and tell you a little story. That person is Brian O'Brien, a member of the Boston College class of 1980 and also a university trustee. I have known Brian for many years. Um, he lives in Chicago. He's a very prominent businessman. And he is the person who provided the funds to underwrite this symposia, which began in 2008. About six years ago, I got a call from Brian who asked if we could grab a cup of coffee. And over that cup of coffee, he told me that he felt one of the greatest problems facing our society and our world was the tremendous strife and conflict among the world's major religions. In short, he was interested in providing a forum at Boston College where these issues could be discussed. Catherine Cornell, because of her work and expertise, was asked to lead this initiative. Today, with four years of symposia behind us and the final one about to be launched, I want to thank Brian for his generosity and thank Catherine for the remarkable work that she has done. Without Catherine's vision, and leadership, the body of work provided by these symposia would not have been possible. Just before I left my office to come over here, I got a call from Brian O'Brien. He is traveling on business. He is driving across the plains of Nebraska. And he told me that he was emailing me a letter to read uh, to all of you tonight. So this is from, um, this is from Brian. The success of this series has surpassed my greatest hopes. The fact that it has served as a forum for new ideas in new, thi in new thinking is not surprising to me given Catherine Cornell's guidance and care over the past five years. What has been especially thrilling and heartwarming has been the popular appeal of the on-campus presentations and the tremendous turnout we have enjoyed at these plenary sessions. A very special thanks also to Catherine for her dedication to excellence and her leadership. I'm especially grateful for the friendship we have developed over the past five years. Finally, I thank Boston College for hosting this forum as it celebrates its sesquicentennial year. Your presence here tonight is just one more testament that shines a wonderful light on the decisions that our founders made 150 years ago to start this university. So those are the words of, uh, of Brian O'Brien. And finally, I would just like to um, invite all of you to share in the three semester celebration that will mark the university's sesquicentennial. We launched it last Saturday with a mass at Fenway Park, 20,000 Students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, and friends came to watch a marvelous mass with 100 priests uh, come celebrating. So that was our kickoff. As you all know, Boston College was founded 150 years ago as a school to, to educate the sons of the Catholic immigrants. Today, it ranks 31st among national universities. So we are all very proud of this institution to which we belong, and I hope you will uh, take advantage and join us for some of these celebrations. If you go to bc.edu 150, um, you will find a list of all the events. So thank you for being here tonight. And with that, I'll turn it back to Catherine. Um, a second person I would like to uh, introduces Karen Kiefer. Karen has played a vital role in advertising and promoting these conferences. She is associate director of the Church in the 21st Century Initiative, and she was always a step ahead of me in thinking of ways in which we can better uh, promote the, the work that we have done. Um, the Church in the 21st Century is also a co-sponsor of these uh, symposia, and so I'm happy to give her the floor to welcome you.
Good afternoon. First of all, no one is ever a step ahead of Catherine. <laughs> that, that goes without saying. Um, I just want to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Church in the 21st Century Center and also our other partner um, with this event, which is the School of Theology and Ministry, and we have uh, Dean Massa here this evening. Um, it's just been a glorious partnership. Um, and I love coming to this event because every year we pack 300 people into this room. And I think it speaks to the reality that there's just this great thirst out there um, to have a conversation um, about interreligious dialogue. And um, your presence here certainly states that. For those of you that don't know about the church in the 21st Century Center, we are also celebrating an anniversary this year. Um, we are 10 years old, and our center lives on the Boston College campus. We were started after the sexual abuse crisis, and Father Leahy wanted to put all the major resources of a Catholic university at the feet of the church and begin a conversation. And uh, that conversation uh, has uh, become our mission, and, it, and our mission is to be a catalyst and a resource for the renewal of the church. So everything we do is towards that mission. I have been incredibly privileged to witness uh, Catherine's dedication and her passion and her energy and her intellect in putting together like a beautiful woven rug um, this series. And every year, uh, it never, ever disappoints. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are videotaping this this evening. We videotaped uh, all the other uh, series uh, programs, and the videotape will be available uh, on the Church in the 21st Century Center's website, as well as the website for this particular project, Interreligious Dialogue, which if you go to the Boston College website and just type in Interreligious Dialogue, you'll land on the page. and. Um, you can find the, the webcast. Um, this webcast will be available within um, two weeks' time, so you can share it with, with everyone. Um, again, I want to thank you. It's been an absolute honor to be a part of this. Um, and I, I, again, I think it speaks to the power of conversation and the power of uh, partnerships and the power that lives within each one of us. Enjoy. So now it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Rosemary Radford Ruther to you. Um, Rosemary Ruther is a carpenter emerita professor of feminist theology at the Pacific School of Religion and the Graduate Theological Union, as well as the Georgia Harkness emerita professor of applied theology at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Professor Ruther has been one of the groundbreaking figures in Roman Catholic feminist theology. Her book, Sexism and God Talk, Towards a Feminist Theology, has long been a classic in the field. It was the first work that I read in feminist theology, and I'm sure it was one of the first works that many among you have read in feminist theology, and it's therefore a great uh, honor for us to have Professor Ruther with us here. Um, her book, Sexism and God Talk, um, offers a critical reflection on some of the central symbols of the Christian tradition, trying to retrieve their liberative potential for women in the Christian tradition. Um, since that book, Sexism and God Talk, uh, Professor Ruther has also engaged very profoundly with ecological issues. Uh, as is evident in her book, Gaia and God, an Ecofeminist Theology of Earth Healing, published in 1992, and more recently, Integrating Ecofeminism, Globalization, and World Religions in 2005. What makes uh, Rosemary Ruther's work so relevant for our conference, though, is that she also is, has been very engaged from the beginning in questions of interreligious dialogue, in particular among the Abrahamic uh, religions. Her critique of patriarchy in the Christian tradition has gone together also with a critique of anti-Semitism and more recently also of Zionism. Uh, this is reflected in early works such as Faith and Fratricide, The Theological Roots of Anti-Semitism in 1979, as well as in more recent books, uh, such as the one she wrote with her husband, 
the wrath of Jonah, the crisis of religious nationalism, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 2002. It is thus clear that Professor Rosemary Ruther has been a prophetic voice in both the areas of feminist thought and interreligious dialogue. Her seminal work in both of these areas has been crowned with no less than 13 honorary doctorates from different universities in the United States and Europe. And so we are very happy to have her with us at this symposium, and uh, I'm very happy to give her the floor to talk on the topic of women and interfaith dialogue towards a transnational feminism. Very nice to be here at Boston College. I've had an opportunity to be here a few times before. I uh, even taught a course one summer on liturgy in which a lovely 85-year-old woman wrote the liturgy for her funeral in which she decided that the funeral would have a series of uh, breaks for smoking. <laughs> 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 they would, you would do the funeral for 10 minutes and then a smoke, you know. I don't know whether there was any interfaith dialogue during these smoking <laughs> sessions, but I always uh, wondered whether she actually used this at her funeral. Uh, in any case, my focus tonight, of course, is women and interfaith dialogue uh, and toward a transnational feminism. Now, second wave uh, feminist theology has been developing since the 1960s, initially focusing, uh, at least in the United States, on Christianity. Uh, Mary Daly, in her 1968 book, The Church in the Second Sex, was a pioneer in the feminist critique of Christianity, and specific, uh, specifically Catholicism. Uh, and this was followed in 1973 with her more radical tone, Beyond God the Father. And by this time, Daly had decided that Christianity could not be reformed and was calling for women to leave, women, men too, leave not only the church, but all patriarchal religions. Uh, but many other Christians were also writing on feminist rethinking of Christianity. And by the 80s and 90s, women in other religious traditions, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, among others, we're beginning to do feminist critique and reconstruction of their faith. And so you can, I think you can say that today, feminist theology across religions is a global uh, and interfaith discourse. Now, in my essay tonight, my talk tonight on women and interfaith relations, I want to first summarize and compare four major groups of feminist theologians writing in the Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and Buddhist traditions. I will then discuss global intercultural relations between Western and third world feminisms lifting up African and Middle Eastern women's indigenous perspectives on their cultural uh, uh, traditions uh, and religions and their challenge, their challenge to Western feminism as colonialists. So I want to explore the question of transnational <coughs> feminist relations uh, and ask to what extent uh, is interfaith and global dialogue between feminisms possible? Can we overcome these kinds of misunderstandings or conflicts and move toward 
mutual collaboration. Now, I begin my discussion on feminist theology with my <laughs> 19, why not? <laughs> my 1983 book, no, it's a pretty good book, no? Um, my 1983 book called Sexism and God Talk for the Feminist Theology. Uh, as an example of feminist critique and reconstruction of Christianity. In this book, I propose as the critical principle of feminist theology, quote, the promotion of the full humanity of women. And I elaborate this principle in the following way, uh, quote, whatever denies, diminishes, or distorts the full humanity of women is therefore appraised as not redemptive. Theologically speaking, whatever diminishes or denies the full humanity of women must be presumed to not reflect the divine or an authentic relationship to the divine or to reflect the authentic nature of things or to be the message or work of an authentic redeemer or community of redemption. And this negative principle implies a positive principle. What does promote the full humanity of women is of the holy. It does reflect a true relationship to the divine. It is relating to the true nature of things, the authentic message of redemption, and the mission of a redemptive community. Now, having enunciated this critical principle <laughs> of feminist theology, uh, I go on to admit that the meaning of the term, quote, the full humanity of women is, in fact, not fully known because it has been negated within the histories that we have known by the denigration and marginalization of women. Still, women's humanity has not been totally destroyed. It has constantly reaffirmed itself, even if in limited or subversive ways. And these partial appearances are touchstones by which we can test and criticize all that diminishes us and to begin to imagine a world without sexism. Now, although patriarchy and the subjugation of women have shaped both the sources and the history of Christianity, the Christian tradition has not lacked critical principles that are usable for a feminist theological development. Foundational to such critical principles, for me, is what I call the prophetic principle. The prophetic principle is not a marginal idea in the Bible. Rather, it can be said to be the central tradition of biblical faith. The critical pattern of thought by which biblical faith constantly criticizes and renews itself and its own vision. There are four components to a prophetic faith. First, God is portrayed as defending and vindicating groups of people who are oppressed and unfairly exploited. Secondly, this implies a critique of systems of power and their power holders who are responsible for such oppression. Thirdly, it involves a critique of the ideology by which oppression is justified and a repudiation of the assumption that such domination comes from God and is based on the divine will. And fourth, finally, there is a vision of a new age 
a new age to come in which the present system of injustice is overcome and God's intended reign of peace and justice is installed in history. Now, significantly, uh, prophetic language in Hebrew scripture and the New Testament is not directed against other religions. It is essentially self-criticism. It is directed against the teachings and practices of its own people, uh, or shall we say the, the, the leaders of its own people, writers seen as leading this people. So God is depicted as repudiating these writings and practices and their assumptions about who God is and what God wants. This God, uh, for example, in the words of the prophet Amos, uh, thunders things like the following. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the song, the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I remember coming out of a church service once and shaking the hand of the pastor, and it was all I could do to refrain from saying, I hate, I despise you. <laughs> Take away from me the noise. <laughs> but anyway, that's pretty heavy-duty stuff in the Bible. But prophetic critique is not a static a set of ideas. Rather, it is a principle of discernment of truth and falsehood, justice and injustice, that has to be constantly applied to new circumstances and new contexts. A prophetic critique, insightfully applied in one context, can become language justifying triumphalism and oppression of others in some other context, when those who are the heirs of that language become the power holders, a power holders that assume that their self-interests speak for God. So that's uh, a key issue. F for example, Jesus' critique of the scribes and Pharisees, I would say, Jesus' critique of the scribes and Pharisees has one meaning as a view of a Jewish prophet within and critiquing his own community, his own religion. It takes on a totally different meaning when Christianity becomes a separate Gentile religion and uses the language, this kind of language, to reject Judaism and to establish the triumphalism of the church over the synagogue within a Christian Roman Empire. The Hebraic prophetic tradition formulated its vision of oppression and hope for liberation in the context of the socioeconomic oppression of the poor by the wealthy and of a small colonized nation by, by a, a small colonized nation by the great empires of antiquity. It was not used to question the subjugation of women or slaves within the Jewish patriarchal system. Although Jews saw themselves as liberated slaves and were, saw themselves as called to liberate other Jews who are enslaved, 
they did not see themselves as, as needing to liberate Gentiles who they enslaved. In the early Jesus movement, some of this begins to be included. Let's say the early Jesus movement in Judaism, let's be, be clear about that. Um, and as Christianity develops, there, this uh, is expressed in a vision of a new humanity in Christ that overcomes the privileged status of male over female, Jew over Greek, Hellene over barbarian, uh, bar, uh, bar, barbarian, and free over slave. But Christianity gradually and eventually developed a new system of hierarchy within a Christian empire that sort of swept this critique under the rug. Uh, and so Christianity has to rediscover and reapply this prophetic liberating principle in new contexts in ongoing history. Now, feminist theology in the late 20th century, I think is the first time that patriarchy as a system was seen as contrary to God's will for creation and redemption. The domination of male over female is distinguished from God's power and will and so the identification of God as a patriarchal male must be questioned. And yet feminism must also recognize the inadequacy of thinking of all women as equally oppressed by patriarchy. And they must, we must begin to identify the complexity of gender hierarchy within class, uh, race, ethnic, uh, and sexual hierarchies among others. The rapid diversification of feminist theologies within ethnic and racial contexts, class hierarchies, and gay and lesbian groups, uh, often adopting distinct names such as uh, womanist or mujerista, represents the coming to voice of distinct groups, distinct groups of feminists in different contexts of oppression within <laughs> patriarchy. Now, in the 80s and 90s, American Jewish women also began to develop a feminist critique of Judaism. American Jewish women had long been leaders of American feminism, but Jewish women who were trained in their religious tradition to reconstruct Judaism from a feminist perspective, this is a more recent development. Uh, some issues, such as patriarchal God language, are shared by Jews and Christians, but other, uh, other issues are distinct. Jewish women do not have to deal with the Christian linking of original sin to Eve as women's representative, since original sin is not a part of Jewish Anthropology, everybody realizes that, you Christians out there? Uh, <coughs> um, but ceremonies such as circumcision and the bar mitzvah uh, have privileged the Jewish male as the normative Jew. Rabbinic laws have excused women from the time-bound commandments of prayer on the grounds that women are busy with housework and childcare, so they don't have any time for those ceremonies. Um, Jewish religious feminists, uh, in other words, saw themselves as needing to create an inclusive language and inclusive ceremonies and religious observances in order to include women more fully in Judaism. Judith Plaskow, in her 1990 book, Standing Again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective, has written one of the foundational works in Jewish feminist theology. And the title of this book comes from the founding event in Jewish history in which the Jewish people stand at Sinai to receive the commandment of God. 
uh, to the people. And to prepare for this reception, Moses gives the men the commandment, be ready by the third day. Do not go near a woman. It's Exodus 19.15. Now the issue here is ritual impurity. In order to be fit to approach God, men must abstain from sex for three days. But this command raises the question of whether women were present at Sinai at all. Now, did both men and women abstain from sex <laughs> and therefore were present side by side? Or were women banished to some other place, you know, listening around the other side of the mountain uh, so that men uh, could be free to approach God? Clearly, it, uh, what this text shows us is that it's men who are seen as the representatives of the people, Israel. And hence, they are the ones who should make themselves pure to approach God and to receive the commandments. Uh, and so for Plaskow, a feminist Judaism must call for Jewish women to be acknowledged as standing at Sinai to receive the covenant as equal members of the Jewish people before God. For Plaskow, it's not enough to reform particular halakha or Jewish laws. One must challenge the fundamental presuppositions of the legal system, namely that women are not normative Jews that women are not called to the Torah, that they are silent in the marriage ceremony, that they are shackled when it comes to divorce. These are not uh, simply um, disabilities that can be reformed. Uh, and in fact, they have been reformed in uh, Reform Judaism. But more basic is the presupposition of otherness of women's lack of normative status as Jews and as human beings. Now this is giving dramatic expression in the Jewish language about God. Uh, although said to transcend sexuality and to be one, God is nevertheless spoken of in language that is patriarchal with male pronouns and images. Although Jewish mysticism integrated feminine imagery about God, uh, this is still seen as questionable, unacceptable even, in uh, normative religious liturgy. And in fact, to do so is to raise the specter of paganism, uh, of the suppressed and negated goddess, of negated religions of the ancient world. <laughs> but unless we can speak of the divine in female terms, God remains seen as a male, and therefore only males are normatively images of God. For Pascal, these two issues, namely women's otherness, and the imagery of God is connected with a third issue, namely that the Jewish tradition is not the product of the Jewish people as a whole, but of men alone. Of course, women have lived in Jewish history. They have carried its burdens and its joys. But women's experiences are not the history that is passed down and recorded in the text. The maleness of God and the maleness of normative Jews, uh, these are the ones who have um, shaped the tradition. Uh, and this tends then to call for the silence of women as shapers of the holy. And so for Plaskow, a feminist Judaism 
demands a new understanding of Torah, of God, and of Israel. The male bias of Torah and the male view of God must be overcome. Women must be fully integrated into the people Israel and its memory and its life. Feminism demands a new understanding of God that is foundational for a new understanding of women as equal and participating members of the Jewish people, shaping its thought and practice. And only then will a reforming Jewish law be rooted in the larger reality of Jewish life. Only when Jewish women can speak and name their own experiences and become a part of Jewish memory passed down in the texts of Jewish life will women truly become integral members of the people Israel. And such a holistic Judaism, feminist Judaism, of course, is also part of a struggle for a more just world. Now, Christian and Jewish feminists in the United States uh, and in Christian countries and, uh, in, and in the Jewish state of Israel, uh, these feminists face right-wing critics that would seek to disallow their questions and propositions for reconstructing their faith. But they are relatively secure in the liberal wings of their community and schools. Islamic feminists, it seems to me, face a, a somewhat more embattled situation, particularly in some Islamic states. And since the 1970s movements uh, of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, they have also been challenged uh, by patterns uh, uh, that in some ways have sought to uh, uh, impose a doctrine of Sharia that would mandate women's subordination uh, and confinement in the patriarchal family as normative. And in fact, some Islamic fundamentalists, such as the Taliban in Afghanistan, have even engaged in violence, such as throwing acid on women's faces as they appear in public with uncovered head or secular dress. Uh, girls' schools have been destroyed, and so on. And yet, despite these threats, there is a strong and growing Islamic feminist movement, uh, a movement that has been growing apace for 30 years uh, or more. And its outspoken advocates unequivocally claim that gender equity is or should be normative for Islam. So turning to Islamic feminists, uh, one, uh, I think, very important figure, and for me, a, a good friend, is Rifat Hassan. So I'll kind of lift her up as a foundational figure here. Uh, she is one example uh, of such Muslim feminism. Uh, born and raised in Pakistan, Dr. Hassan has taught religious studies at the University of Louisville, Kentucky, for many years, and her research has focused particularly on the Quranic understanding of the crea creation of humanity as male and female. Creation by God uh, in the original creation. And how does this creation firmly establish gender equity of men and women as normative for Islam, despite some later Islamic exegesis, to the contrary. Now, until recently, uh, the hadith, or the oral tradition attributed to the prophet, uh, and also the jurisprudence, has been interpreted solely by men. Uh, and women uh, have been said to have been created from the left 
that's the bad side, the left rib of Adam, uh, <laughs> and to have been created as subordinate to serve men. And yet, what uh, Rifa Hassan discovered, uh, the study of the Quran itself shows that this whole tradition is not present in it. The Quran does not contain the rib story. Uh, of Eve's creation, it only speaks of the creation of Adam and Eve at the same time as equals. The rib story and the idea of women's secondary creation as subordinate came into the Islamic tradition later. Guess from where? <laughs> Probably from Christianity. Now, for Hassan, this is a, a, a very important discovery, a kind of a, kind of a mind-blowing discovery. Uh, the creation of men and women at the same time as equals needs to be understood as foundational for the Islamic uh, vision and viewpoint of anthropology. In Hassan's words, the only way that the Muslim daughters uh, of Hawa or Eve can end the history of their subjugation at the hands of the sons of Adam is by returning to the point of origin and challenging the authenticity of the laws that make women der uh, derivative and secondary in creation, but primary in guilt, sinfulness, mental and moral deficiency. <laughs> uh, they must challenge these later s sources that regard them not as ends in themselves, but as instruments created for the convenience and comfort of men. Now, I also want to mention two other leading uh, Muslim feminist theologians, Amina Wazud, author of the Quran and Women, uh, 1999, and also Inside the Gender Jihad, Women's Reform uh, in Islam, which is uh, 2005. And also, um, Asma Barla's uh, book, Believing Women in Islam, Unreeling Patriarchal Interpretation of the Quran. That's 2002. These books have focused uh, particularly on God language in the Quran uh, and, uh, in, and the vindication of women's equality with men in the sacred text. Central to the Quran uh, and to Islam as a whole is the absolute unity or oneness of God, is a very central principle. Islam rejects the Christian trinity and the divinity of Christ as violations of the oneness of God. God is understood to be incomparable and unrepresentable, particularly in anthropomorphic terms. And this understanding of God establishes the oneness in relationship to, to creation, particularly uh, humanity as male and female. Male and female as equal to one another, imaging uh, this oneness of God. <coughs> imaging God as male and the male as a particular representative of God is forbidden. God is also said to do no injustice by setting one group as superior to another. And so this forbids the understanding of God as setting men as superior and women in a secondary relationship to men in society. Reform of law and practice in Islam must be rooted in the primacy of the Quran as the foundational source for understanding who God is and how God has created humanity, male and female. So this is very foundational for Islamic feminists. 
Now turning to Buddhism, we see here, I think, to uh, a complex tradition, a complex tradition with some conflicting views of gender. Uh, it is said that the Buddha was reluctant to allow women to become <coughs> monastics and was finally persuaded to do so only on the condition uh, that the nuns be strictly subordinate to the monks. <laughs> Even the oldest and most mature nun must defer to the youngest monk. And in fact, even the existence of women monastics uh, is deemed to be regrettable. It is said that Buddhism would have lasted a thousand years rather than falling into crisis after 500 if women had not been admitted to monastic life. And because female monastic life is seen as less worthy, nuns tend to receive much less financial support uh, from Buddhist laity than the male monks. Uh, the Buddhist understanding of karma, which itself um, is derived from Hinduism, makes the very existence of women a product of bad karma. <laughs> Rather uh, than being liberated from rebirth, uh, women are reborn in inferior social statuses reborn as female as an inferior status because they have failed to live purely in their previous lives. So these are some of the traditions, some of the Buddhist traditions uh, that throw in the question whether women can truly become Buddhist or become fully enlightened because of their inferiority as women. And yet many Buddhist women feel that these negative traditions are more than fully offset by other traditions. Other traditions that insist that men and women are in fact equally capable of, of enlightenment and that the uh, view that women is inferior to men is in fact an illusion of false consciousness and egoism. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Uh, for a Buddhist uh, feminist theologian, Rita Gross, who will be one of our speakers in this symposium, uh, in her uh, foundational book, Buddhism After Patriarchy, uh, 1993, what is particularly attractive in Buddhism is the lack of a god to whom the believer is asked to submit. One does not have to struggle with the maleness of God or how to include the female as image of God since there is no anthropomorphic deity. Rather, the divine is a life process, a life process of coming to be and passing away. Uh, and Buddhist meditational practice leading to enlightenment and compassion for all sentient beings entails giving up an ego clinging that seeks to hold on to one's selfhood uh, as if it were in eternal life. So freed from such possessiveness, one can affirm the life process as it actually exists. Uh, and this meditational practice is the same for men and for women, uh, or in really Gross's words, the Dharma is neither male nor female. Now, for really gross, Buddhism, in its essence, is not only egalitarian, uh, it can even be said to be identical with feminism. Like feminism, Buddhism begins with experience and directs one toward a process of dissolving and discarding a, a kind of ego clinging that blocks liberation. And yet, uh, Gross admits that Buddhism has been shaped by patriarchy in Asia, um, 
and even says that Buddhism in its Asian patriarchal setting would not have been her religion of choice, I mean, in its Asian patriarchal context, but in the late 20th century, United States where converts to Buddhism have been drawn from progressive feminists, it becomes possible to discard these patriarchal overlays and discover the liberating center of essential Buddhism. For Rita Gross, Buddhism and feminism in her life and practice have become a process of mutual transformation. Buddhism can be deepened by bringing in prophetic concern for injustice and hope for social transformation. And at the same time, Buddhist meditational practice has enabled her to relax, to discard the anger and distress she once felt about gender injustice. In her words, perhaps we can envision a marriage of compassion and righteousness in social ethics, a gentle and active approach to such issues as gender, inequity, privilege, and hierarchy. So these, this is a kind of review of some very foundational and key feminist thinkers in Christianity, Judaism, um, Islam, and Buddhism. Now these feminist theological thinkers that I mentioned uh, are not necessarily originally from, but they have been teaching in the United States either in religious studies departments of universities or ecumenical settings uh, where there is dialogue with other religions. They have differences from each other. Uh, many Christians, of course, would disagree with the Islamic rejection of the Trinity and the divinity of Christ although perhaps Jews would agree with this. I think they would be sympathetic to this idea for the same reason, namely a strict monotheism. Um, Islam disagrees with Judaism uh, on the view of the election of the Jews um, since they believe that God's relationship to humanity includes all people equally. Um, and perhaps Christianity would be favorable to that idea. Um, um, Christians and perhaps Jews and Muslims uh, might have problems with the Buddhist denial of ontological status to the divine or to the self. So what I'm saying is that there are a variety of of differences and conflicts uh, in theology between these traditions. Um, there, but their differences actually are different differences between these religions, but not necessarily differences between these writers' view of feminism. In other words, as feminists, they draw on similar principles all of the writers across the four religions would agree with the quest for an inclusive God, a God who is not male and does not choose males as superior uh, and representative of the divine, but establishes an equality of men and women to each other and uh, to God. Differences and conflicts between feminists have appeared across global regions, uh, I would say particularly has, as they have been divided by colonialism and imperialism in the relationship of Europe and North America to Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. Uh, and so I want to turn to these conflicts and 
uh, challenges uh, to Western feminism as colonialist. Uh, as I pick up the theme of, or the question of a transnational feminism. Now, several uh, African scholars, Afri African scholars who are African, <laughs> uh, and scholars of Africa, uh, both male and female, have vehemently disputed the ways in which Western scholars, including some Western feminists, have interpreted African social history as, quote, primitive. Where did we get that one from? Social history is primitive and as oppressively patriarchal toward women. Uh, Nigerian sociologist, Oyeronki Oyeyume, her, her 97 book, The Invention of Women, Making African Sense of Western Gender Discourse. She has argued that the Western categories of gender have no relevance in Africa. <coughs> On the basis of her study of the Yoruba of Western Nigeria, she concluded that gender was not a key category of pre-colonial Yoruba society, but rather the central organizing principle of social relationship was a seniority and not gender. Uh, another important African scholar, Ifi uh, Amaliyumi, she's also a Nigerian sociologist, uh, she argued against what she saw as Western distortions of African social development. Uh, in her book, um, 97 book, Reinventing Africa, African Matriarchy, Religion and Culture, she sees pre-colonial Africa uh, as African societies as having complementary systems of matriarchy and patriarchy in ways that coexisted and supplemented one another. Uh, and women, in fact, had their own systems of power that included land ownership, women's council, and rule. And the goddess was central to the women's religion, uh, the interaction of male and female systems of power created a certain gender fluidity, allowing men and women to cross gender boundaries and to exchange roles and statuses. Um, and uh, um, Amaliyumi explores this gender fluidity in her uh, very important 1987 book, Male Daughters, <laughs> Male Daughters, Female Husbands, Gender and Sex in African Society. And here she explores the pre-colonial African practices of allowing females to play roles, usually monopolized by men, and this included taking a woman as wife and being classified as a male for purposes of power. Um, very, very interesting book. Uh, uh, in the view of these scholars, patriarchy uh, in the negative sense, uh, was seen as being partially introduced uh, by Arab slave trader societies that came from the 11th century on, but more thoroughly introduced by European colonialists uh, in the 19th century, British, uh, French, Belgian, among others. Women's organizations such as organized uh, market, women's market associations, in fact, vehemently resisted this European colonization, uh, and they were, in fact, violently oppressed uh, and put down uh, by the colonialism. Uh, Western scholars of Africa, including feminists, have largely 
in their view, largely ignored or misunderstood this rich and complex history of African societies, uh, and they have imagined that they, as Westerners, were bringing modernity and the liberation of women uh, to Africa uh, without really understanding or respecting the local culture. Uh, but relationships of Western feminism and colonialism, I, I would suggest, are more complex. More complex simply than the idea that Westerners are dominating third world societies and Western feminists are uh, reading these societies through the lens of an ignorant uh, paternalism. There are also cases where the leaders of a, quote, third world society have entered into colonial relations with the West and have become advocates of Western feminism in order to dominate their own society. And a fascinating example of this uh, is Iran, uh, whose shifting history in relationship to both colonialism and feminism is traced uh, by the Iranian historian uh, Nima Nakibi in her 2007 book, Rethinking Global Sisterhood, Western Feminism and Iran. Nakibi begins her story with the British uh, women adventurers to Persia in the late 19th, early 20th century, such as Gertrude Bell, uh, and Ella Sykes. Uh, these women traveled to Persia uh, when Britain was uh, competing with Russia uh, on, uh, per for Persian resources. Um, so, so the, in effect, the, the, the West was bringing, was seeing itself as bringing redemption to Muslim women. Uh, by freeing them, so to speak, from subordination and passivity, which they assumed had been imposed on them by Islam. Uh, women from the West were seen as having a special role in this conversion and liberation of Muslim women of Persia, uh, since they, unlike the male missionaries, could enter into the harem and bring the Christian and Western messages of education, healthcare, and fuller humanness to these poor excluded Muslim women. Um, now this relationship of Western colonialism and feminism took on a different meaning uh, in the 1930s to 60s in Iran. Uh, in 1936, uh, Risa Shah Pahlavi, after a visit to Turkey, where he was impressed uh, by Ataturk's modernization policies, legislated the Unveiling Act, where he forbade women to wear the veil in public uh, and commanded his soldiers to arrest veiled women and tear the veil off their head. <laughs> Uh, if they appeared in public uh, with any form of hijab. Now this means, uh, of course, that more conservative women uh, who wanted to wear the veil could not function in public. Uh, and this, uh, this means in practice also that rural and lower class women were banned from public functioning, although they needed to be there both as shoppers and also as people who had goods for sale. Now, under the new Shah in 1941, wearing the veil became a choice. Women could choose whether to veil it or not. But the class aspect of this choice still remained. Unveiled women in Western dress were the educated upper class. Uh, the veiled woman uh, was assumed to be uneducated belonging to lower class or rural families, and royal women or upper class uh, women championed feminism and saw themselves as bringing modernity to Islam, to, to Iran. Um, 
Now, the result of all this is that feminism becomes identified with colonialism and Western imperialism in Iranian history. Uh, and so in 1983, when the Shah was overthrown, an Islamic anti-colonial regime was introduced, the revolutionary leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, then implemented a veiling act, which prohibited women from appearing in public unveiled. And now they could be arrested if they appeared without a veil. Um, in other words, what we see here is the veil becomes identified not simply with Islam, but with an Islamic anti-colonial nationalism. And it's precisely this kind of uh, complexity which I think today uh, makes it difficult, not only in Iran, but other Muslim states to globally distinguish the decision of a woman not to wear the veil from a modernity identified uh, with colonialism, or to affirm an indigenous feminist right to, that might include wearing the veil as a choice for one's own identity. Um, now, how does a transnational feminism cut through these confusions uh, and affirm the choice uh, of Muslim women to wear or not wear the veil? That's not loaded uh, with these feminist uh, colonial and anti-colonial um, messages. I have a section in here about my experiences in Botswana, which were very uh, enlightening to me, but I've been told I have five minutes left. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, skip towards the end here uh, and say that, you know, as we, uh, including my group that went to Botswana to really try to understand their uh, uh, democratic reforms, including feminist reforms in Botswana, uh, needed to understand that we went there not as reformers who were going to tell them uh, what they should do about gender, uh, but rather uh, that we went there to really to understand their context, their history, uh, and how they were creating uh, their uh, own reforms, their own transformations. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, clearly we understood that it's only the people of Botswana in their own historical context that can further this process of gender reform. Um, and they have done a great deal of reform in terms of bringing more and more egalitarian laws and relationships of men and women in Botswana. Uh, they have found a kind of difficulty in two areas. One of them is in the whole area of defining uh, coerced uh, sex in marriage as rape. Uh, they came very close to passing that, but, but balked at, um, at full inclusion of that idea. And secondly, on the question of allowing homosexuality and, and homosexual relations are illegal in Botswana. So these are questions uh, that, are, that are very much in conflict, uh, but clearly there are questions that uh, our good friends in Botswana have to work through in a way that really can be accepted and affirmed in their own culture and uh, by their own uh, uh, people. Um, so in that context, uh, what does a transnational feminism mean? Uh, basically, it seems to me, uh, it means that Western feminists, uh, men and women, concerned with gender equality uh, in countries such as Botswana or in India or any place else, um, that we basically meet the people there as equals. Uh, Westerners do not come assuming that they have some superior modern culture, which are, they are there to impart uh, to somehow less developed people. 
Uh, now, this does not mean that liberal feminists need to deny principles and, and values to which they are committed. But these are points of discussion uh, and not some kind of arrogance and superiority. Uh, our first agenda is to understand how our friends in Botswana are working in their own historical and cultural context, and only in that way can we really work together as colleagues. And this is the rich and still very much emerging promise of a transnational feminism. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Ruther. Uh, and I'm sorry for cutting you short, but we also want to hear from our respondents uh, this evening. And our first respondent is this evening is Marianne Moyart. Uh, you may notice that we have tried to hear from women from different generations. Uh, Professor Moyart re received her PhD from the Catholic University of Louvain in 2007. Since then, she has been twice awarded a very coveted research uh, fellowship in Flanders. She also teaches at the Free University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on the hermeneutical, ethical, and theological presuppositions of interreligious dialogue, and she is uh, one of the rising new young stars in this area. Last year, she published her four first and widely, widely acclaimed book, Fragile Identities Towards a Theology of Interreligious Hospitality. Professor Moyat has been particularly uh, involved in the dialogue between Christianity and Judaism, and we look forward to hearing her comments on the paper. Good evening. In her lecture, Rosemary Redford Wooter presents a survey of the major developments in feminist theology, a theology that is becoming increasingly more global, transnational, and interreligious. Over the last 40 years, feminist theology has undergone a process of continual expansion and diversification across race and ethnic groups, across nations and continents, and across faiths. Initially, the feminist movement was characterized by a certain desire for unity which sometimes even resulted in viewing differences and particularities as a threat to the feminist pursuit of gender equality. There was a tendency among white Western feminists to speak as if all women are alike and shared a common experience as women, an experience which was in fact that of white female American Christians. It has been a challenge for, those fe for these feminist theologians to renounce their ideal of unity, and to learn to appreciate differences as potentially enriching. The concept of global sisterhood, which was not inclusive of the experience of women from the south of the world, and tended to downplay the differences that divide women, race, ethnicity, cultural, sexual orientation, and class, has become suspect. Wouter's feminism exhibits a commitment to a dialogical practice that recognizes the complexity of embodied differences in the task of building solidarity. Firmly convinced that interreligious dialogue is a healing practice, she seeks to link di di uh, di uh, diverse feminisms without requiring some master theory that forces all differences onto some for question bed of commonality. On the one hand, she affirms that all feminisms are driven by a shared recognition of women's conditions of subordination and a commitment to end situations of inequality. The critical principle of this feminist struggle for justice is the promotion of the full humanity of women. On the other hand, would avoids a thick definition of the full humanity of women, which would stifle any real dialogue. Shiwara opens up a space for interreligious dialogue where women belonging to various religious traditions can both criticize ideas that have promoted distortion and recuperate those elements from their traditions that can help to transcend false ideologies. She argues for a dialogue that plumbs the depth of religious traditions and their ethical values, while also seeking out ideas that offer a glimpse of a more just world. 
Her vision of an inclusive community seems to represent some sort of regulative ID. It always orients the discussion without determining its precise outcome. Only to, a, to an exchange of multiple forms of wisdom can the critical principle of the full humanity of women become a truly embodied principle. Now, I'm impressed and challenged by Wouter's approach. Impressed by the straightforwardness of her approach and challenged by the questions it raises. My questions are mainly meant to problematize matters that I believe invite us to further reflection. In doing so, I hope they will contribute to a stimulating discussion we are going to have during the next few days of this gathering. My first quest question relates to Wouter's understanding of the relation between religion and ethics. I wonder if despite her nuanced sensitivity for the diversity of women's experience of oppression and her appreciation for the substantial differences between religious traditions, her feminist approach to interreligious dialogue still functions as a unified perspective accommodating differences. To be more specific, I am not convinced that her emphasis on the centrality of prophecy does justice to the complexity of religious traditions in general and the biblical tradition in particular. I am left with the impression that she seems to be equating authentic religious life with prophetic engagement and social action. Justice becomes the criterion to discern what is meaningful, true, and worthy of pursuit. Put differently, by looking at these traditions mainly through the perspective of justice, I wonder if she does not tend to pass over or downplay the importance religious believers may also attach to the ritual, spiritual, and doctrinal dimensions of their tradition. Religion runs the risk of being reduced to ethics, a development which does not necessarily match the way women experience their religious life. Religious commitments can take root in various experiences. Some people are struck by the beauty of a certain tradition. Some search for wisdom. Others for the quietness of prayer or the peace of heart brought about by ritual life. Most often, it is a combination of these factors. Is it not so that this also expresses something of the fullness of what it means to be human? From a Christian, to be more precise, Catholic point of view, I would therefore like to ask Rute how she sees the interconnection between the four dimensions of ecclesial life, diakonia, kerygma, liturgia, and koinonia. Would I be correct in assuming that ethics should take the lead? Does it become the norm to judge and transform the other dimensions of ecclesial life? If so, how would you account for this ethical priority? Would you point to the urgency of instances of oppression needing attention? Or would you argue that deep down the biblical tradition has always primarily been a prophetic tradition? But then what about those who would argue that doctrine forms the heart of religious life? Or that Jewish Christian traditions actually sprang from various ritual practices? Would you then respond that they simply have to re rearrange their priorities? This brings me to my second question, which is somewhat related to the first. If my first question asks if Wouta does not downplay the complexity of religious traditions, my second question asks if her focus on experiences of justice and injustice does not restrict the complex, rich, and multi-layered moral experience. Her focus on issues of justice tends to give the impression that moral life is mainly about alleviating and removing instances of injustice. By the way, that is also what a liberationist approach to interreligious dialogue sets out to do, placing issues of justice front and center on its agenda. Without denying the importance and urgency of issues of social justice, it does seem to present a rather narrow view of morality. In line with the Aristotelian tradition, I propose a more broader understanding of morality, which involves the promotion of appropriate behavior, of finding the right measure in complex situations, of learning how to deal with situations of infidelity, jealousy, and despair, of seeking to deal with the human condition in all its weakness and its strength. Morality in this broader sense relates to the cultivation of dispositions such as hope, pride, and trust, 
courage, courage and acceptance, and yes, even revolt. What is more, the various religious wisdom traditions have a rich story base narrating the temptation of evil, to evil, the vulnerability of men and women. Narratives of holy anger, vocation, obedience, and responsibility. And many of the symbolic and ritual practices enact these moral feelings in such a way that believers learn to deal with them appropriately. Let me suggest that for the feminist interreligious dialogue, it might be worthwhile to also look at these wisdom traditions from this broader spectrum, spectrum of moral feelings and interrogate how their stories and ritual enable or inhibit women to cope with the complexities of life. Issues of justice and injustice for sure, but also feelings of remorse and tragedy, loss and gain, pain and desire. I am moreover sure that this would help give us a richer and more complex understanding what the critical principle of the full humanity of women might entail. My third question. When listening to Wouter's lecture, and reading some of her other works, I was deeply impressed by her determination and the clarity of her position. Though she leaves space for the negotiation, for negotiation and affirms the importance of contextualizing the quest for justice, she nevertheless comes across as very conscious and certain about what the priorities are in the encounter between women belonging to various religious traditions. She not only recognizes the importance of a hermeneutics of suspicion, which reveals the adverse effects of Christian tradition, but also welcomes the possibility of rethinking and transforming superseded doctrines. She challenges persons to join her on, her on, his, on this transformative journey by employing different devices, both to unsettle our comfortable consciousness and to shatter our stabilized symbols. In agreement with the humanist tradition, her approach excludes, excludes a liberated, rational, and almost voluntaristic attitude toward tradition. But, there's always a but, what I miss in Wouter's approach is a recognition of the ambivalent nature of religious identities. And so I remain not entirely convinced. I would like to draw attention to the fact that there are dimensions of religious belonging that remain opaque that we draw from critique, that do not listen to reason, and that even remain deaf for arguments about inequality, distortion, and oppression. Is it not so that women often maintain a rather ambiguous relationship to their religious tradition? A relationship of attraction and repulsion, submission and revolt, acceptance and rejection, a longing for silence and a desire for, for, to protest. Often these contrasting attitudes are intertwined. It is not unusual that women maintain a hold of their tradition, even when that tradition is not innocent, even problem problematic. It is not uncommon that women, who conscious of the oppression of certain practices, narratives and doctrines, nevertheless remain attached to them and even regard them as sacred. It's not uncommon that they do not know how to legitimize their attachments even to the extent of feeling quite uncomfortable about them. This is not just the case for conservative women who would object to any change. I would hypothesize that this also holds true for those women committed to the feminist cause. This experience of being torn in different directions, of conflicting loyalties, of ambivalent emotions can make women quite vulnerable in their religious commitments. Moreover, this vulnerability is only truly felt in the encounter with the other, who summons us to render account of our commitment with plausible arguments. Being torn in different directions and having to negotiate conflicting commitments, women may sometimes long for a home where they do not have to deal with complex and critical questions. A unified community, an uncomplicated uncompli commitment, a pure tradition. It can be exhausting not knowing where one is headed. It is most certainly embarrassing to realize that one remains attached to traditions that may also be oppressive. The messy, ambivalent nature of their religious identities can very well lead to a longing for closure, exclusivity, and control. 
a longing which is certainly, in view of interreligious encounters, quite problematic. I must confess that I do not know how to deal with this problem. I certainly do not believe there is an easy solution to it. I am less optimistic that invoking prophetic criticism will necessarily lead us forward. It might even make matters worse. Instead of opening up a perspective of liberation, it can also bring on a certain paralysis, the inability to move and change. Beside prophecy, and I think Wouter would agree, a feminist theology of interreligious dialogue should also call attention to spiritual and ritual moments of peace and quietude. Moments where its struggle for justice and liberation can temporarily be suspended, where silence can be found and where ambivalence is looked upon with, with a certain religious kindness and charity, where ambigu ambiguity is regarded as part of what it means to be fully human. I think such peaceful religious moments have the silent power to integrate and invigorate the feminist and interreligious struggle for justice, thereby also contributing to the advance of history towards more equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to get a, a response from Rosemary, but I'm sure we'll hear uh, in the next few days from that. So our second respondent uh, this evening is Nelly van Doorn Harder. Uh, professor van Doorn Harder is professor of Islamic studies at Wake Forest University. She is originally from the Netherlands and received her PhD from the Free University of Amsterdam, where she also still holds a part-time position. She's an expert in Coptic uh, Christianity and has published book on, books on contemporary Coptic nuns, 1995, on the emergence of the modern Coptic papacy, 2011. She has been very active in the area of women and interreligious dialogue in general, and in particular uh, in the dialogue between Christianity and Islam. In 2006, she published a very uh, well-received book, Women Shaping Islam, Indonesian Muslim Women Reading the Quran. Please join me in welcoming Professor Van Doorn. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, after reading uh, Professor Moyard's wonderful response to uh, Professor, Mo Professor Rosemary Vera Rutford, um, Red, 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 Red Ruder, I thought it would be maybe uh, good to pose the question if her call to a, uh, her prophetic call to recapture the humanity of women, uh, how applicable it is. And my question comes from the fact that in the Netherlands, I was part of a team that put together a book uh, on the topic of this conference the agency and role of women in the interfaith dialogue. And what struck us was that in the book, the words feminism, theology, or even interreligious dialogue hardly appear. Most of the writers fall back on the courses on social, anthropological, cultural, legal issues that seem to face us when we think about the lack of women, the invisibility of women, and the lack of women's voices within the interreligious dialogue. So when it comes to interfaith dialogue, and I personally use the word interfaith because interreligious means mostly the official religious faith. We, we speak also uh, people who have, do not have faith speak together too, who do not have an official religion and so forth. So when it comes to the interfaith dialogue, both men and women face multiple challenges, and these are directly, rec directly related to the developments that we find both at the grassroots level and at the level of the academic studies. And in between, we have the myriad of interfaith activities. 
And so we are basically looking at a field that is very rapidly changing, a field of study that's very rapidly changing, and where we all are somehow trying to aim for moving targets. And so the whole, the idea was of the team, the, the, the common, uh, uh, almost a conclusion was that we are right now in a, a, a time, a gap time of interreligious dialogue. We started out with very clear goals where the dialogue was mostly theological, mostly academic, and now interfaith dialogue and interfaith activities have developed all over the world on so many levels that we are lacking clear and unified goals. And so what the, the main question was, are we truly engaged in interreligious exercises? Are we still talking about religion? And so when we focus on the role of women, what comes up in uh, when, what really struck me when I was reading uh, the fantastic presentation of Professor Ruther was her, the last part of her presentation that she could not really elaborate on uh, because she only had five minutes left, <laughs> where she was talking about her, uh, her experience in Africa and where she mentions the example of a country that has uh, a justice for women very highly uh, in its legal system and at the same time oppresses women by not accepting, for example, certain forms of rape and by not making them punishable by law. And so um, in many ways this comes, this coincides with the findings that we cannot overcome the legal situation of women just by interfaith dialogue. We some seem to have to take deeper steps in overcoming the injustice that women fa face. So now I want to, um, uh, uh, a little bit connect Professor Ruther's paper to the themes of this, uh, this um, a meeting and also to some of the papers that I have been reading and you have not seen yet. Uh, unfortunately, because first of all, when we think about women who are invisible in the interfaith dialogue, it is not just women that stay on the sidelines. We also have to connect this, uh, if we speak about the topic of justice, with the poor, with youth, with those who fall outside the gender mainstream, for example, homosexuals. Um, they all share in the fact that they are absent from what we see as official dialogue, as the high levels of dialogue, of interfaith dialogue. And for example, uh, Professor Janine Hill Fletcher's paper for this conference points out that at the high level, um, uh, dialogues have been largely concerned with the authoritative perspectives emerging from leaders of religious traditions. When, for example, a group of predominantly male Christian and Jewish leaders present their joint definition of the parameters of marriage as an interreligious dialogue activity, in fact, they create a high wall for certain individuals. They construct these parameters of personhood that mean that not only gay and lesbians are absent in their model, but also single parents no longer count. So one of the problems of the theological forms of interfaith dialogue has been, for example, that our theological reasoning has led us to the comparison of sacred texts, where we try to find points of contact, and we are so excited about finding these points of contact that we then forget the repercussions of, of our findings. And I hear, um, uh, men, uh, refer to the paper about uh, that discusses this discovery of Abraham as the perfect connector between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. While we can all respect Abraham as the first human being who spoke with the one and only God, he even allows a space for the women, which is more exciting, until we look what that exactly means. Because what do we see when we study Sarah and Hagar? 
women are giving the themes of a regrettable rivalry among two women, of one of them having to be a single mother in the desert, and of having to live in dire poverty. So we start to create new forms of dialogue looking at one aspect, which is the male aspect, and forgetting what the real lives of these women were in their legal and political systems. At the same time, when we step away from the uh, comparison of, of text and of the trying to uh, find new ways of theological reasoning, we see that we also face very rapid changes caused by demogra demographic changes. For example, we see new patterns of immigration that have resulted in a host of mixed marriages. And these have challenged our religious leaders to rethink the boundaries of their sacred texts and institutions. So one of the most important paradigm shifts that we have all been seeing and that has been happening over the last 30 years is that we try to de-emphasize the variant truth claims. Now, as the majority of these new discussions um, supersede what used to be dogmatic and theological, at the same time, we see that these new situations have produced new dialogue bul bulwarks dominated by men who have produced statements about engagements with those of other faiths that rarely reach the daily lives of the average believer. So one wonders how many of these interfaith discussions serve to veil the fact that, in fact, they were not forms of interfaith dialogues, but of intra-faith dialogues. It means people using the other religion as a mirror to understand themselves and their own position vis-a-vis -vis the other. So this brought up to our question, were we actually talking about inter or intra-faith debates. Now, while the high-level discussions continued, at the grassroots, women started to play defining roles in the changing landscape. And they found that many sources of interfaith discussions are not necessarily religious in nature. Broader cultural factors, for example, can pose greater obstacles than differing religious creeds, ritual practices, or metaphysical worldviews. Now, in her book on interfaith encounters in the United States, Kate McCarthy found that at the grassroots levels, systematic philosophies or religious worldviews are secondary to living in a pluralist society. Pra pragmatic concerns take precedent over doctrines, relationships over dogma, and religious resources can be used constructively in interfaith engagement as long as they can be seen as tools that eliminate differences and create connections between people. So our other question was, are we still talking about religion or have other concerns taking or have other concerns taken precedent? Women are most active at the grassroots level and where their activities now include also the agnostic and the atheist views, in there, the dialogues that are the emerging at that level do not always mesh with official interreligious dialogue. So we reach the point where some even suggest leaving out deliberate discussions about faith at all. And an example of this uh, type of thinking is in the Chicago Youth Corps. I don't know if you know the Youth Corps, but they developed its pro pro programs to get young people of different faiths talking together based on social, psychological, and educational research. The idea arose that when young adults intentionally work together on certain projects, for example, building a house for Habitat of Humanity, discussion of their views, their ethical views, their world views, maybe their religious views, will follow during meals and when hanging out at night. So the broad idea behind this approach is, brings us to another issue, that is that the language of respect, the language what it means to be human, and the desire to understand the other are not inborn capacities, but they are skills that have to be learned. And while verbalizing one's religious opinions has to be learned, 
we are lagging behind in teaching these very important skills to our children and to new generations. So women, um, as researchers such as Maura O'Neill have found, often speak a different interfaith language from that, that of man. So our question was, what language should we learn when we discuss the shared humanity? However, would speaking the language guarantee that the issues women care about are brought to the table? Michael Trice, who is now a dean of for ecumenical interface studies at Seattle University, and is, who is a seasoned veteran of the high-level male-oriented dialogue, has observed that women are never disinvited from the tables. But when they are at the same tables as the men, they face forms of what Michael has called cruel kindness. Uh, quoting moral philosopher Annette Bayer, he speaks about misleading behavior. What does it mean? Women are welcomed warmly on the surface, but in reality, existing structures, laws, cultural, political, and social conventions throw up roadblocks that prevent full participation. Invisible opinions and norms about the role of women meet invisible structures of hierarchy and authority. And these realities force us to broaden our gaze when we investigate women's role and agency within the interfaith activities. Now, in my own country, the Netherlands, and I want to mention this because Professor Ruther has been talking about Africa and about Muslim countries and so forth. I am from the Netherlands, which is considered one of, one of the most developed countries in the world. Two professors, two full professors from the Netherlands are right here. <laughs> and very many women are heading interfaith projects, interfaith dialogue projects, and they're teaching about the pro topic in the universities. In the, according to the United Nations standard of measuring development, we are in the top 10 as far as women's position is concerned. However, even in the Netherlands, we are missing from the interfaith, the official interfaith levels of dialogue, and nobody can figure out why. So reading through the many fascinating contributions that will be presented during this conference, I would also wish to stress, stress that the challenges we face are first and foremost local. And I think this came back in Professor Ruder's experience in Botswana, where she, shows, where she showed, as I earlier mentioned, how legal and political systems are wedded to social prejudices and become the forces that disembody the women and render them invisible in certain areas of society. And at the same time, Botswana, as well as the Netherlands, as well as many other countries, remain, and I quote, strongly committed to gender equality as integral to its self-understanding as a democratic state. So the question is, if we talk about interfaith dialogue, should we not prioritize the reinterpretation of legal, social, and other systems that question women's full humanity? instead of only speaking about religion and what it does to religion and what it does to our conditions. Women cannot escape local conditions. Local forms of prejudice and legal injunctions will not vanish just by participating in interfaith dialogue. The center of dialogue has been shaped by these local elements. And as a result, scholars such as Helene Ecknell have started to call for a move to the fringes where women could be able to create their own agendas and approach their own and create their own approaches to interfaith dialogue using new forms of language. However, this past week, we have witnessed once again the disastrous consequences when women leave the center. We all heard about the movie of the Prophet Muhammad that has set groups of men all over the Muslim world on fire. Such occurrences press the point that women should insist on being in the center of the dialogue and not allow small groups to speak on their behalf. I happen to know both the Coptic Church and Muslims really well, and I know that in Egypt there are numerous, numerous, very strong projects 
of men and women working to get to know each other better, to put down a fundament based on interreligious dialogue, especially some of my Jesuit friends have been very strong, have been at the forefront of these efforts. And yet, a seven minute clip of a movie put on the websites of radical Muslims has, has eradicated, has seemingly eradicated that entire uh, foundation from our eyes or from the awareness of the world. And so, knowing that there were many men and women, Copts, because you know, Copts are Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, all of them involved in the interfaith dialogue with Muslims, it brings, to, it brings home to us that it is very important that we should define our goals, that we should discuss what we are changing, what we are seeking to change. Are we seeking to change the theological discourse? Or are we looking at theological disagreements? Or do we aim at addressing current and future problems that arise from how the interpretations and the applications of religious ideas affect society? And should we then not put the women in the middle? Should not women have jumped into those groups and talked maybe in another way or in another form of discourse about this movie? Now, if we are serious about interreligious dialogue, we need to define our agendas more precise. We need to work at the local grassroots level before we hurry to the high-powered global meetings. And we need to invite all who matter to the table, men, women, the poor, the young, and those who do not fit into conventional categories. By pressing the points of clarity and topic goals and participants, women will be able to move into the center. And so I saw Professor Ruther's speech as a, as a prophetic voice, as a hope, as filled with hopeful goals and prophetic visions that will remain to inspire us as we try to build these new structures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly, and thank you all for uh, staying until the very end. Um, I think it was worth our while, and thank you, Nelly, for giving a taste of what we will be discussing in the next few days, also in Dover. Again, the volume will be available uh, next year about this time. So have a nice evening, and thanks again.